ambassadors, representatives, Special Advisor Karim Khan, my dear friend Amal Klon, good afternoon. I would like to start by thanking the co-hosts of today's event. I'm also grateful to the members of the Security Council for making UNITAD's work possible. Special thanks to my friend Karim Khan for tirelessly leading UNITAD's innovative documentation efforts. It has been an honor working with you, and I wish you the best in your new role. If you had told me when the Security Council was debating UNITAD's creation that I would be able to bury my brothers within four years, I would not have believed you. I did not think that their remains would be identified or that I would be able to say goodbye and finally lay them to rest. It was too painful to hope when my community had been ignored for so long. Yet, this past February, thanks to multilateral action from member states and the ongoing work of UNITAD, me and many survivors were able to honor loved ones last during the Kojo massacre. Yazidi families wish to return home to Sinjar but living among mass graves is unthinkable. Those who were able to bury relatives in Kojo have gained a piece of closure that is needed to restart our lives. The burial ceremony was a small taste of what comprehensive justice could mean for my community's healing. It solidified my understanding that accountability is not an abstract legal principle, but something that tangibly affects our everyday life. As I recently told Karim, those of us who were able to bury family members earlier this year are considered fortunate. Fortunate is difficult to comprehend when you realize that some families identified as many as eight relatives in one mass grave. But the basic dignity of bearing a loved one seems like a privilege when the majority of mass graves remain unexhumed. There are thousands of survivors with relatives missing in ISIS captivity or unmarked graves. For many, Loss is magnified by uncertainty. I lost my mother and six of my brothers. I was ripped from my homeland, separated from my sisters and nieces, and sold into sexual slavery alongside too many Yazidi women and children. I may never know what happened to my sisters-in-law, or schoolmates, but the horrors I survived pale in comparison to the pain of, the, of watching my community continue to suffer. Seven years have passed. For seven years, more than half of my community has languished in internally displaced camps, waiting to return home. For seven years, Almost 3,000 women and children have waited to be rescued from captivity and reunited with their families. For seven long years, hundreds of thousands of Yazidi genocide survivors have awaited justice and accountability for the horrific crimes they endured. I am fearful, not of ISIS, I am fearful that survivors will never receive justice. I worry that mass graves will become landmarks in Sinjar and victims will never receive dignified burials. I am terrified that the world 
will forget what was done by ISIS. And perpetrators will be free to continue inflicting sexual violence and ethnic cleansing on women and girls like me. The possibility of repeated persecution is not hypothetical. Yazidis in Iraq were subjected to decades of discrim discrimination and multiple genocides. I cannot help but wonder if accountability for these crimes would, would have pre prevented ISIS from repeating history. The truth is that the evidence collected by UNITA does not only paint a picture of what happened to Yazidis in 2014. It provides a forecast of what Yazidis, minorities, and women will suffer in the future if you do not act. When we fail to hold terrorist groups accountable for genocide and sexual violence, we invite future groups to commit the same horrendous crimes. This is a dangerous precedent to set. The United Nations was established to hold parties accountable for genocide and to prevent atrocities. Because of that promise, survivors have put themselves at a great personal risk to share their experiences of sexual violence. They have defied taboos and faced stigma in the hopes that you would hold their abusers accountable. As member states, you have a responsibility to pursue justice for the sake of Yazidis and your own founding principles. Yazidis cannot restart their lives without stable security and governance in Sinjar. We cannot restore our homeland without international support. We cannot begin to heal without trials in national and international courts. We are thankful to all member states who have, su who have supported evidence collection and justice for Yazidis and minorities in Iraq. Now member states have the opportunity to lead the decisive next steps in the path to justice, not only for Yazidis, but for all religious minorities that suffered from ISIS's terrorism, including Christians, Shabak, Kakai, and victims of Spiker massacre. With clear evidence that ISIS crimes can constitute genocide, it is imperative that justice no longer be delayed. I stand before you today to ask you to establish formal legal proceedings, send the Yazidi case to ICC, or create a court by treaty. I also welcome the efforts that the legislators in Baghdad and Erbil are undertaking to create ISIS courts that comply with international standards. The Yazidi community's faith in the justice process would be greatly strengthened by the involvement of international judges and monitoring by the, by the international community. For true justice and reconciliation, survivors must see that due process is appealed in Iraqi courts to count of genocide and sexual violence, not only terror, terrorism, and that survivors are included in this process every step of the way. Evidence reveals that ISIS carefully planned the Yazidi genocide. The international response should be no less, no less thorough. Without accountability, Yazidis are stuck in a cycle, cycle of suffering, genocide, sexual violence, impunity, repeat. You all have the power to break this cycle. Thank you so much.